I don't, it's, uh, it's really, the, the project he's working on is really amazing. And uh, I could think of three or four ways to start using it um, uh, by the end of the talk. So I'm going to talk about another location tech project uh, called GeoTrellis. Um, how many of you were here this morning when I did a quick, like, five-minute intro? Not many. Okay. So for those of you who were here, forgive me. I'll probably repeat a couple of things. But um, uh, other than that, we'll try to uh, uh, go into a little bit more depth. Uh, so Azavia, uh, which is where I'm from, uh, and the company that works on the GeoTrellis project is uh, what's known as a B Corporation. Um, B Corporation is a new kind of company that's a cross between a for-profit and a non-profit, and we apply um, power of business to, to uh, change things. Um, in particular, we go after projects that have civic and social impact, and open source is a big part of uh, uh, the outcomes of what we, what we do. Uh, we work on a, uh, an effort called Summer of Maps. Uh, if any of you know nonprofit organizations that are interested in doing uh, spatial analysis work, uh, I invite you to uh, come up and talk to me about it later. This is a way to um, uh, match uh, uh, students studying spatial analysis in school with nonprofit organizations doing spatial analysis. So, all of our, our mission is around applying geospatial technology for uh, civic and social impact. A lot of our work centers around land, water, and people. Um, and uh, we've been around about uh, 12 years, and uh, uh, a number of the uh, uh, projects we were working on began to run into some fundamental limits, and this is uh, part of what led us to, uh, uh, to work on GeoTrellis. So uh, uh, some of the inspiration for, uh, for this goes back to the 1960s and the early days of GIS. Uh, this guy, Ian McCarg, uh, who wrote a book called Design with Nature, um, 1969, and in that book, he outlined a planning approach uh, for planning regions and communities that relied on acetate sheets that were overlaid on top of each other. Uh, these, uh, the attempt to automate this overlay process was part of the origins of uh, GIS. I learned this stuff from a guy named Dana Tomlin, who uh, recently released a revision of his book uh, on map algebra called GIS and Cartographic Modeling. Uh, and when I finished graduate school, um, where I had learned GIS on things like command line uh, Adrisi, I don't know how many of you are, um, have worked with that before, uh, but uh, uh, when I finished graduate school, one of the things I really wanted to do was start to bring some of this spatial analysis capability to the web. Um, and uh, ran into a number of uh, fundamental uh, challenges. I think I uh, so one of those challenges is around performance and scalability. Um, getting uh, large data sets or even modestly sized data sets to run fast enough that you can get real-time responsiveness or alternatively or both uh, that and being able to serve lots and lots of users uh, uh, simultaneously is a pretty, uh, pretty big challenge. Uh, for many years, just getting maps to display in a scalable, performant way was a significant challenge. And I think we've made a ton of progress in that respect. And uh, one of the next frontiers is around being able to transform data in, uh, in real time. Uh, so uh, I wouldn't necessarily call GeoTrails a big data project per se, even though that's the title of this uh, session. It could be used to process very large data sets. It could also be used for small ones. Uh, and there are lots of different uh, modes in which that might happen, but this, these kinds of data sets are uh, growing in the, the, both the civic and, and science and, and public spheres uh, very, very rapidly. To give a couple of examples of the, the kinds of things we're thinking about, the city of Chicago has a GPS uh, device on the top of every car in their entire fleet. They're capturing GPS points for every car's movement uh, throughout the day. In the course of a year, they gather billions of GPS points that they could use for potentially, potential analysis. We all know some of the social media things that people have uh, talked about in other presentations at this event. Um, science is, of course, generating uh, uh, ever larger um, uh, data sets as well. Uh, to give you an example of the kinds of data sets we're trying to process for GeoTrellis, we're specifically focused on primarily raster data sets, so imagery or non-imagery raster, uh, things that are organized in grids of cells. An example of this might be the national elevation data set. Um, and the challenges for processing this led us to, uh, uh, to work on GeoTrellis. So what is GeoTrellis? 
GeoTrellis includes a, a number of different components to it. We are trying to attack file I.O., input-output uh, input speed. Uh, this was a, a key bottleneck that we found in a, in a, a lot of operations. Uh, actually building geoprocessing operations that are distributed across multiple machines. Being able to distribute raster data in a tiled way across multiple machines. Uh, and then being able to provide web services, REST APIs uh, in front of that. Um, the original use case that we uh, went after was the one that I uh, described earlier, simple weighted overlays. In map algebra terms, these are called local operations. They operate on a cell-by-cell -cell basis. They are embarrassingly parallelizable. Uh, they are very easy to break up into, into components on multiple machines or multiple threads and be able to uh, process in parallel and then reassemble. Uh, the, our original use case was around uh, real estate siting, being able to pick a great location for your house uh, and be able to uh, factor in and weight multiple different components, uh, being close to a grocery store or being uh, near your workplace or near your kid's school, uh, close to downtown, near restaurants and so on, be able to weight these uh, and be able to provide a very scalable application. Uh, from there, we uh, experimented with uh, business siting applications. This is an economic development application you see up here uh, for the city of Asheville. The conventional way that we've done this kind of work in the past has been to take a desktop GIS, like Arc ArcGIS or GRASS. Uh, there are sometimes nice user interfaces around enabling us to assemble these models uh, and then be able to even potentially deploy those. Uh, but our goal has been to do so on the web. Uh, and these are the kinds of applications we're trying to enable. Simple uh, user interaction, being able to adjust parameters on the fly, and be able to see the results uh, instantaneously. So how does GeoTrellis work? Uh, this, uh, there are kind of two modes you can use GeoTrellis. One is around uh, uh, being able to do this kind of real-time, low-latency processing. Uh, the second is around uh, cluster-based processing. So I'm going to walk through that real-time example first. That was really where the project began. Um, from the client side, whether this is a mobile device or a web browser, uh, a, a request goes out to the GeoTrellis REST endpoint. Uh, we began with Jetty, uh, but we've been slowly taking Jetty out and replacing it with, uh, with Spray, uh, which is a nice toolkit for generating REST endpoints. Uh, that REST endpoint then calls uh, 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 or uh, refers to a set of raster data that may be tiled across multiple machines or maybe on a single machine. Um, that raster data uh, is consumed by a series of operations. Uh, those operations are distributed using a number of other open source toolkits that have been really key to enabling us to do this. The first is a language called Scala. Uh, how many people here know what Scala is or have used, how many people have used it? Uh, a couple of folks, that's awesome. Uh, Scala is a really interesting language. It's specifically designed as a uh, functional programming language that also supports some object uh, uh, type syntax. It compiles to the Java Virtual Machine, the JVM. Uh, that makes it really flexible in terms of being able to run anywhere that the JVM can run, uh, but provides a much um, less verbose uh, environment than Java, as well as the advantages of a functional programming language, specifically developed around building distributed processing systems. Uh, in addition to Scala, the language, uh, we began uh, by using a toolkit called ACA, which is written in Scala. ACA is for uh, not using a map reduce style distribution approach, uh, which we've heard a lot uh, uh, around Hadoop and, and Google and, and other um, types of approaches, but instead of map reduce, it uses an actor-based model uh, that's more, um, uh, more designed for real-time processing concerns. Uh, we, our original versions of GeoTrellis use this ACA framework. Uh, uh, the Spark project, which you may have heard about earlier in the plenary, uh, was not um, something that was available at the time, but um, has since sort of, it uses ACA itself and has since uh, uh, zoomed past um, uh, other toolkits. And so we're in the midst of retooling GeoTrellis to take advantage of Spark. Uh, Spark also very much designed for lightning fast uh, uh, cluster distributed computing. As we add Spark support, we're also adding support for HDFS, the Hadoop, uh, the Hadoop file system. So we aren't necessarily using MapReduce all the time, but uh, uh, we do support components of the Hadoop uh, ecosystem. 
Another important toolkit is also part of the location tech community, the JTS uh, topology suite. This is a, a series of Java tools. We've uh, recently begun uh, adding some Scala wrappers around this, and it's enabled us to support uh, vector types of data inside GeoTrellis. So here's the completion of the, of the loop. Uh, the GeoTrellis uh, framework uh, generates either JSON or uh, PNGs or that sort of thing that gets sent back to the, the client. The cluster style processing looks a little bit different, um, but uh, uh, operates in much the same sort of way. Uh, this is for batch type uh, scenarios um, where uh, you may not be able to get the kind of real time processing you want, but you still want to uh, significantly accelerate uh, processing of a, of a very large data set. So for example, you might use the real time processing work for regional or statewide uh, a data set that may be measured in thousands or tens of thousands of cells uh, vertically and horizontally. Uh, but you might use that batch approach for the entire national elevation data set, uh, which it weighs in at six terabytes. Um, we can significantly accelerate processing of this, but this is not yet something we can, we can pull off uh, uh, national scale uh, real-time responses on. Uh, so a few uh, diagrams that kind of illustrate how things work. Uh, we're mostly working on raster, so cell-based data sets. We're combining uh, 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 multiple data sets. This is a very simple uh, pair of rasters that combined into a new one. Uh, if you're doing, let's say, a local add operation, uh, you would add the same cells in, in, two loca in the same location on two different layers to get a new value. When we are breaking these up into tiled data sets and distributing them across, let's say, an HDFS uh, Hadoop file system cluster, uh, not all the tiles may be on every machine, but they get the same raster data set gets broken up into several uh, different components and distributed, and then those all get added together simultaneously and then recomposed. So that's sort of conceptually how it works. Uh, I'll zip through that. I don't think that's adding anything. Um, uh, we have recently added an extension to GeoTrellis called GeoTrellis Transit that is able to consume OpenStreetMap data as well as GTFS data, the, the general transit feed specification, and use that also in a custom data structure that uh, supports really fast processing to generate um, uh, not just routes but uh, transit sheds, travel sheds. So being able to take a location and say, show me what I can get to in 10 minutes or an hour or this sort of thing. And do that through different transit networks. So both driving, but, uh, but also transit. Uh, I mentioned earlier we relied on ACA initially. Uh, when we released version 0 0.9, we were largely still reliant on ACA. 0.9 supports uh, parallel operations across tiled data sets parallel execution of those operations, and some basic uh, clustering capabilities with ACA. Uh, but it doesn't do uh, sharding of raster data across a cluster, caching of operation results. We have some basic caching, but not at the level of granularity that we would like. Uh, we didn't, at 0 0.9, we can't currently support HDFS. We don't have really great, uh, uh, we have fault tolerance, but not at the level we would like. So if you execute an operation and that operation fails, we can re-execute it. But if a component worker inside an operation fails, we would have to start the whole operation over rather than just starting that component of it. So that kind of fault tolerance is not supported with, um, with ACA out of the box. Uh, and we'd also wanted to get some advanced uh, scheduling capabilities. If you look at what Spark can do, uh, it caches, it supports uh, fairly sophisticated caching. Um, it's uh, really quite good for these kinds of iterative algorithms. Uh, it outperforms Hadoop uh, uh, significantly, and, uh, primarily because it doesn't rely on MapReduce per se. Uh, and it works with the HDFS, and it provides that kind of advanced uh, fault tolerance. And um, uh, so as a result, this is why we are uh, uh, switching horses a little bit. Spark underneath the hood still uses ACA. Uh, we'll just be um, retooling to uh, have that one layer more abstracted. So what's possible with this kind of system? Uh, I'll zip through a few examples. Uh, the kinds of things we're trying to support are uh, things like urban forestry modeling. Uh, some of these will have a lot in common with the GeoMesa folks as well. Um, uh, being able to simulate the growth of trees over over a uh, uh, over a region for 
5, 10, 15, 20 years and their ecosystem services impact. So what's their value in terms of saving energy and, and so on. Uh, educational games. Uh, this is a, a project that we worked on with the Stroud Water Research Center and was actually sort of GeoTrellis 0.1 uh, uh, and it's aimed around supporting real-time stormwater modeling uh, such fast enough that we can uh, embed it inside a game that kids can learn, around, learn about water. Uh, I uh, mentioned earlier the transit modeling. These are examples of travel sheds from different locations. Uh, Real-time modeling of sea level rise under different carbon scenarios, under different types of actions. Uh, I mentioned that already. Streaming data, so real-time streams uh, for kernel densities. Um, some uh, Zonal summaries, things like uh, uh, counting carbon. Uh, crime analysis. Uh, uh, we are also using this for crime forecasting, a similar application to what was just shown for Geomesa. Uh, we're doing this with some machine learning approaches, though, where we're actually uh, uh, playing multiple models off each other and then uh, picking the best one for a particular location. The kinds of things we're trying to enable uh, police departments to do are to uh, uh, take scenarios like this where you're a police captain working in a precinct. It's the third Tuesday in May. Uh, the, uh, school is in session. There were two burglaries and three assaults yesterday. Uh, the Washington Nationals are playing this evening. Got six bars, three takeout stores, high school in the neighborhood. The forecast is for 67 degrees Fahrenheit and a 50% chance of rain tonight. To be able to take a, and, a, and you got three vehicles and let's say a couple of people on bicycles and on foot. Where do you put them tonight? Where do they go that will have the max when they're not responding to 911 calls? Where will they have the maximum impact? So we're able to take not just past crime data, not just the space and time components, but uh, weather, proximity to things, and be able to uh, work all of those into models and um, play them off each other. So the key elements here are third Tuesday in May, schools in session, we had these kinds of events yesterday, uh, and so on. So that combination of data science and geospatial data uh, is very some, much something we're trying to enable uh, with GeoTrellis. So uh, that wraps things up for me. Uh, the the uh, things we would, uh, we would love to see all of you uh, be using not only GeoTrellis but the other location tech projects. Uh, these are very much community developed tools. Uh, as I said early in my talk earlier today, uh, the switch of uh, licenses uh, brought in um, from a GPL to Apache brought in new uh, people using GeoTrellis almost the next day. Uh, and we now have a number of different contributors from several companies around the country and uh, uh, even around the world, and uh, we're pretty excited about it. If you're interested in joining us, uh, you can find us on IRC at uh, hash, hashtag GeoTrellis on Freenode. Uh, there's a Google group called GeoTrellis User, and you can find us at geotrellis.io. Thanks so much.